you know, I don't think that's ever happened before. <laughs> I would normally go through my whole good morning, good morning routine, and you completely pulled the rug out from under my feet. But I'm going to do it anyway. Good morning. Good morning. And that, look at that. Normally, it takes three times, sometimes one, twice, but that was once. That was fantastic. I feel my work is done. I can go home. No, that's, that's, every, that's everyone's cue to say, no, no, please stay and tell us about the housekeeping, which I will do shortly, and I will introduce our keynote speaker shortly. First, though, I want to do th two things. I want to welcome you to Learning and Skills Group 2013, our summer conference. Thank you very much for coming along. We're kicking off almost on time, which is unusual for us. Uh, what will happen is, as you know, with Olympia, we have surges of people coming through on the train, surges of people coming through on the uh, lifts, and so we'll have another 30, 40, 50 people coming in who will be seated at the back. But I wanted to reward the people who actually taken the time to get here on time uh, this morning and actually start as close to 9.45 as possible. So thank you for that. Let's crack on. I'm Don Taylor. I'm the chairman. And yes, I will get to the housekeeping once all those other people have arrived. And there's some important stuff to get through this year because we have an exhibition taking place as well as the conference. But I also wanted to use the time that we have rather than listening to me talking about housekeeping, to actually have a conversation with each other and also uh, with me about where we are in learning technologies at the moment and learning as a whole and what we think we should be doing about it. Now, I realize I've come to stage, Mark, without my clicker. Is there a clicker here for this? Yeah. I only started as a stand-up trainer um, 27 years ago. And I obviously have forgotten everything I ever knew. Thank you very much. OK, so I'm going to quickly go through something, and I want you to have a conversation about it. I've been talking a lot recently about something which I call the training ghetto. Does that make any sense? To anybody? anybody heard that term before? Yes? There's a, sorry, there's a noise down here, a slightly weary, yes, Don. <laughs> We've heard you talk about that before. I'm going to talk about it again. I think it was Nigel Payne in the front <laughs> row. Um, I'm going to talk about it again because I was chatting with Gerd just before he came uh, on stage and we, we worked out that actually it reflects quite well on what he's going to say. Let me quickly rattle through something, then I'm going to ask you to discuss amongst yourselves where you think you are on a grid that I've put together. So we talk about change very often as, as a, a linear thing, it's fast or it's slow, fair enough, but I think that for us in the learning and development field, we should be thinking about this as a two-dimensional affair. And we should be looking at change both for ourselves in our learning and development departments within organization. That's the vertical axis there. And also, we should be looking at how fast we're changing with respect to our organizations that we work for. So left to right, horizontally, how fast is the organization changing? Vertically, top to bottom, how fast are we changing? If both the department and the organization are changing fast, then we are in what I call the risky leadership zone, which is a good place to be. It's risky because when you're leading, things can go wrong. If you're changing slowly and the organization is changing slowly, you're down here, it's, it's quite comfortable, actually. You're doing the same things we've always done. We are producing an annual, annual schedule of courses. We are putting people through these classes, typically uh, in, the, in the classroom. And there is no demand for change either on the organization or on us, which is great until something goes wrong. And something will always go wrong because business is changing too fast for that to be a sustainable model. And that's what I call comfortable <laughs> extinction. And we keep chundling along until we get hit blindsided by a truck, which we didn't see coming. And unfortunately, I've seen too many organizations like that, like Kodak, inventor of digital um, photography, goes bust because it's simply not changing fast enough. Top left corner, we're changing fast. The organization's changing slowly. That's an uncomfortable position to be in because it's frustrating. We know we could do great things in the organization. They just won't let us. And that's what I call the zone of the unacknowledged profits. We're wailing in the wilderness. If only they would listen, then we could transform the organization. The reality is, actually, in that area, I think that we probably can change things. If we find one or two managers and leaders that we can focus on, and they can work with us to help things change. But I only suspect that most organizations that I've talked to, actually, are in this bottom zone here, where 
All the exciting stuff is being done elsewhere in the organization. Marketing are doing uh, wikis with the rest of the organization. Uh, so, well, it could be marketing, it could be research. Sales have got a mobile application they've set up and running, all of which we could have helped with. But instead, we are physically separate, usually, from the rest of the organization, Search, certainly spiritually separate from the rest of the organization. They see training as being something that we are, that they go to, they are taken care of, and they come out again, almost like a, an old-fashioned factory where you're, you're put in, your head's filled up with knowledge, and you come out again. And typically, we're doing induction and compliance training, and all the really interesting stuff is being done elsewhere in the organization because they're agile, and they can do things faster. And that's the bit that I call the training ghetto because it's physically, certainly spiritually, separated from everything else. Okay. I don't normally give myself five minutes at the conference to talk about what I think is important, but this is, for me, so important at the moment that I really thought we should share it, and I should use it to stimulate two minutes or three minutes of discussion, which will then lead very nicely into what our keynote speaker is talking about, because he's talking about change. So what I'd like to ask you to do is to, you know what's coming next. Who's been to one of these conferences before? I don't even need to describe this, do I, with so many people in the room, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'd like to turn to the person sitting next to you. If you came with somebody, and you know that person, who are you going to turn to? The other person. Thank you. All right? So make a new friend. What I'd like you to do, hang on, I didn't tell you what you're going to discuss yet. <laughs> you're an eager bunch, aren't you? But it's, it's to be honored. I'd like you just to discuss where do you think you are on that grid, and what are you going to do about it? Where are you? What are you going to do? And you might say, actually, I disagree. I think Don's talking rubbish, and that's fine too, because we are here to share together. So, now you can start talking to your newfound friend. Where are you? What will you do? Two minutes. It's going to be a record. 
Okay, that is a record. I counted 12. Congratulations. A tsunami of conversations started, which is fantastic. It's what we want. This is what the event today is about. It's about sharing things, about sharing our insights, our knowledge, our issues that we've got, and getting advice from people on how we can get over them. And indeed, uh, our, when we have our keynote in a few minutes' time, we're going to operate that way as well. We're going to have a keynote, which is a man talking for half an hour, the rest of it being conversation with the audience. And so I'm delighted that we had such a lot of chat there. Now, of course, I'm going to say, does anybody want to share anything? And I'm expecting a forest of hands to pop up. There we go. Goodness me. Sorry, were you, were you waving at me or waving at somebody else completely? Somebody else. Somebody else. That's nice. Thank you. <laughs> that makes me feel very special. Anybody want to share something? <coughs> yeah, this happened to me the recent. Yes, go on. Ah. But the rest of it's carnage, maybe in the ghetto. Right. Um, my organization was in the rail industry. It tends to lean towards this side of the industry. Yep. Our business is trying to lean towards that side. It's a really weird kind of Actually, it's a really good point. So what I've got here is a, is a rather coarse way of looking at the world, and this is a really good point, that individually we can actually be well ahead of what's going on, but our department, very often this is the case, we're trying to drag along with us, trying to get them in the 21st century, and... How the heck do we do that? Well, it's, it's, I think it's a really good point. Hopefully, we'll get some clues during the rest of today to, to help you on that journey, and indeed from the rest of the community. Let's not finish the conversation today. Please, everybody, I, I'm sure you know this, but you are all members of the Learning and Skills group. And if, well, yes, you are, if you, well, you are all members by virtue of being here. If you haven't registered, go ahead and register, and you'll find yourself uh, on, on the website, and you can be part of the community, learningandskillsgroup.com. Any other points from this? Yes. Quickly. So one of the things that I think is interesting is a lot of the organisational pressure, for example, the issue of yeah. environmental agenda, actually about the majority of the things that we all yes. do anyway in learning. Yes. Not yeah. Yes. Not being able to control the state and so yeah. on. Well, it's true. The, the very often, business agenda opens the door for us. The question is, do we have the guts, the skills, and the attitude to step through it? Very often, I notice we don't. I think we need, perhaps, to be given some encouragement and sometimes a kick to get us through the door. Any other thoughts very quickly? Uh, but, but it's all from this row, which I feel a bit bad about. <laughs> you go on. Go on. Sorry. One of the things I think the model might want to acknowledge is um, the degree of respect that learning development has as a function yep. as being an enabler for change. Yep. And I think that differs to different parts of the organisation. Absolutely. So you can be going through a fast pace of change, but actually there's a low acknowledgement of anybody's role in trying to make some of that change. And I think there's an awful lot of that going on. Uh, and I think one of the big skills that we need to have for our profession is putting ourselves forward to be acknowledged as catalysts of change and enablers of change in the organization and beyond. You know, oh gosh, lots of hands going up. I tell you what, I'm going to say I love you all <laughs> deeply, but we're not going to do them because I want you to save the questions for our keynote speaker. And I, you know, I, it's not my job to stand here and eat into the time of somebody who spends the, his life traveling the world, talking about the future, and precipitating great thoughts in our minds. So I'm going to hold those for a second. Let's pick it up over coffee. Right, let me get through the housekeeping now that we've filled up and everybody's here. First point, fire, no drills planned. If the alarm goes up, we're following the green signs. Uh, we've been safe for the past 14 years. We plan to keep being so. We will go down the concrete stairwells, assemble in the car park by Kate G. Gate G. The... Wi-Fi is rather a long one, but it begins LSG. The hashtag is hash LSG13. The Wi-Fi username and password is LSG13 in capitals. Is that clear? Good. Okay. I don't want to have to say that again. It's very, very simple, but I had, I've had lots of people already ask me what it is. LSG13, what is it? Rowdy lot at the front here. In capitals. Actually, no, the capitals, to be fair, actually, is important. So I don't want people getting frustrated that you can't get onto Wi-Fi. So if your username and so on is that. Right, now, the big difference this year to previous years is that we have an exhibition running concurrently. Exhibition of 32 um, ex exhibitors and four seminar theatres in the East Hall, which is great. Uh, there's going to be people milling around from that, and there's you guys as well. You have a badge that has a black strip on it. That entitles you to get free teas and coffees at the hatch. So if you look at, the, there are various stations around where you can get food and drink, 
But if you look at the lifts, on the right-hand side, there's a service hatch. That's where your free teas and coffees are. You also have, in your packs, a lunch voucher. You can exchange that for your lunch at any of the food service stations, two in the foyer, one in the exhibition area. Uh, further, uh, drinks are provided. We've got drinks going on from 5 to 6.30 over the road at the Hand in Flower pub. 5 to 6.30 at the Hand in Flower pub. If you want to go, please get a ticket from the reception desk. Okay. Finally, it's time for me to introduce our keynote, who is... One of our keynote speakers was one of our keynote speakers in January, and we enjoyed what he had to say so much, so we invited him back again. I asked, asked him, well, how do you want me to introduce you? Do you want a long one or a short one? He said, Don, keep it short. So all I'm going to say is we've had a lot of people winning awards on this stage, but I don't think we've ever in the past had somebody who's won a Quincy Jones Award. <laughs> yep. He's got a rich and wide background. Please give it up for our keynote speaker today, futurist Gerd Leonard. Go. Thank you. Thanks, Donald. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to operate the switch. This is all my technical skills I can muster. <laughs> all right, thanks very much for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be back here. Uh, I really enjoyed being here last time. In fact, I would wager that I learned more from you than you did from me, which is the ideal scenario, I suppose. So uh, the title is kind of ominous, which is why I put the red dot there. You know, work, living, learning in the future. It's about life, I suppose. Uh, so I'm hoping to share some ideas with you today. I'm uh, G. Leonhardt on Twitter. So you can tweet questions using the hashtag and my name if you want. We're going to get back to it. We have a slightly different format today. I'm going to do 30 minutes of, of my slides and talk, and then we're going to have a discussion with Donald and, and myself and, of course, all of you. So um, I skipped the introduction. You, know, you, you guys probably know by now what the future is. is you know, I look at key trends in the next three to five years, not 20 years. Uh, and basically, that future in the next three to five years is already here. So we clearly know things, you know, when you're looking at the Google self-driving car, that this is clearly going to be our future in most cities, is that we use those cars on a, on a flat rate. And it doesn't take much imagination to think where this is going, uh, at least in, in places like London or Singapore or Los Angeles and New York. I sometimes call this the digital default. This is, in fact, a rather scary thought when you think about you know, the NSA and all the recent things from this week. Uh, the digital default means is that everything is becoming digital. Uh, our media, our lives, our health records, our education. In fact, I would say that basically being in the learning business, you, know, you become the primary driver of transformation for, for your company because it's all digital now and it's, it's available. That brings a lot of lifestyle changes, digital lifestyle in parentheses. You know, there's no real difference between digital and, 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 and physical in that sense anymore. If you're looking at this graph, in 2020, we'll have maybe 8 billion people, out of which 65% will be on the Internet. Uh, and I would say in many countries, especially developing countries, the connection will be next to free, and the devices will be $10. They're already $30 for a tablet called an Aakash in India, $30. So Amazon, Jeff Bezos has already let it known that eventually the Kindle will be free. So as long as you buy the books, you get the free Kindle. Think about what that will do to education and training and learning and communication. So, uh, you know, Star Trek, Matrix, Minority Report, Frank and Robot, all that put in a blender, push the button. So basically what happens here is when we look at this, you know, we are about to jump into a different fishbowl. Um, and this is really important, I think, because it takes courage to make this leap. My theory is I think that a lot of companies and organizations, you know, this, this water level is going to dry up. And we have to jump into a new fishbowl, and that is what I would refer to as transformation. This is not about change. Change is, change is good, right? But it's sort of incremental. Transformation is becoming something different. Banks, for example, will not be about bank accounts, and charging your interest. In Africa, the banks are replaced by mobile phone operators, and we pay each other through the mobile phone. 50% of cash in, America, in Africa is moved on mobile phones. So what's the bank going to do in the future? Transformation. If you look what happened to Apple, 
before the iPhone, and now 50% of, of Apple's revenues have to do with the iPhone. Five years later, it only took five years to transform Apple into a company that's in the mobile business. So transformation, crucial. And we're living in an exponential world. This is very hard for us to take because humans are not exponential. You, know? you don't learn twice as fast next week than you do today. We're, you know, we're not machines yet. So this is a real challenge for us because now we're, we're no longer counting one, two, three, four, five. We're counting one, two, four, eight, and we're now at four in terms of technology. At Moore's Law, every 18 months, twice as much technology. So if we're now at four, the next point is eight, not five. So go back to your CEO and say, no, we're going to be at eight next year, not at five, and then 16. So we don't have time to muck around and think about one, two, three, four, five, because that's not the speed of technology. That's our human speed. So Ray Kurzweil, who is a famous futurist, singularity movement, he talks about what happens here will be online at all time in virtual augmented reality. Computer displays will be fully integrated with real reality. That's definitely a scary thought. It's also a good thought, of course, because as nuclear power, for example, it can kill us or it can make energy and, and, and heating. The question is whether you like it or not, whether it's good or not. I think exponential technology changes, but humans remain linear. So while all this is happening, we have to make sure that we don't have to force ourselves to become exponential, because we can't. We can't work 16-hour days just because technology can work 24-hour days. Uh, social media, for example, has already led to the effect that a lot of people are working 20% more using mobile devices and social media because they're constantly connecting with people about business. I'm sure you can attest to that. So that's a real challenge there for us. And then we have this reality, for example, in advertising. If you're looking at, you know, this is why publishers are suffering because they're selling less, less ads on paper. And then digital advertising is only sort of percolating along. So this is where it comes down to belief. What do you believe is going to happen? Do we need to put up a paywall to force people to pay for news? Or will this curve all of a sudden explode and make it possible? The answer is, well, clearly, it may take longer. True. But when it happens, it'll be bigger than anything that we have anticipated. And that's the law of exponentiality, right? That's, that's this law. So we're no longer living in a world where we can safely make a plan or a road map to say, OK, it's going to be a linear thing like this. It's all about pivot points, takeoff points. When does it take off and how? So you may have heard about the Internet of Things, connected devices, sensor networks, synchronized traffic lights, what's called the Internet of Everything. Basically, what, what is happening now is that everything is becoming smart. So now you have asthma devices that you blow into the device, and it has a radio frequency chip that tells the network that you've blown into the device so your parents can know that you're safe. Or it analyzes the way around you to tell others that you shouldn't be going to this part of town because it's too heavily polluted. Network devices, I mean, this is the mind-boggling development of the Internet of Things. This is a really interesting slide from a company called Libelium showing us how everything is going to be connected in the next probably five to ten years. People are estimating 100 billion devices connected to the web. We're talking about waste management, smart parking, uh, design of water quality, monitoring, all of these things together. You can download the slide yourself. But basically, the connectivity of everything. This brings up, of course, huge issues about you know, who's able to see what and things like that. But you can safely say, I think we're already moving in this environment. We're moving into what's called cloud culture. Everything that we do is moving into a place, jukebox in the sky, our, our movies, our music, our education. I mean, there's like 100 startups now that are offering free education online of all kinds of levels. So cloud culture means that all of a sudden the rules of the game have changed because who's, who's authorized and who's, who's accredited, who's allowed to say things? Public relations, for example, is completely gone, basically, as a business. Because what, what is public relations? Pushing somebody's opinion out and, and, and disseminating it, all of a sudden that has moved to the cloud. This machine here is called the Baxter. It was invented three months ago, $27,000.
Baxter is a robot that will do just about anything you teach it to do. You, you take his arms and you show him what to do and he'll learn it. This is the first robot that they have over one million orders already for this machine to help old people deal with things, to work in the hospital, to come along with a doctor, things like that. It's pretty mind-boggling. So basically what we're seeing here is we're going to see, especially in the learning business, future assistance be software robots, database robots, intelligent systems. I mean, if you're using Amazon, and Amazon says if you like this book, then you also like that book, that's a primitive version of the artificial intelligence. If you use Google Now, Google Now will tell you you're about to go to this event, but it's been delayed because of traffic, and you can go to Starbucks and use this coupon to buy a coffee. It will anticipate your activities by data. So we're looking at this becoming sort of a standard, and uh, this is a really interesting slide from McKinsey, and they're showing that we have a, a gallery of disruptive technologies coming up, and you should investigate yourself a little bit there. The mobile internet, basically 80% of the entire world's communications in five years will be mobile. So if your company isn't mobile, and your, your materials aren't mobile, and your commerce isn't mobile, you, you won't exist. It's 80% of, of everything. Moving to mobile devices. Automation of knowledge work. I'll talk more about that in a second. Again, artificial intelligence technology finding things on our behalf, getting very, very sophisticated. The Internet of Things and cloud computing. But you can download the slides later at my uh, website, girdcloud.com, which is my Dropbox folder if you want to browse through it. So a very important point. Uh, just Google for McKinsey, uh, McKinsey uh, information or something, aut automation of knowledge work, you'll find the whole set of slides there. So basically what they're saying is that we have a value being unlocked of $5.2 trillion in the knowledge economy of finding things and making sense out of things. Additional labor productivity, application, smart learning, diagnostics, discovery, and on and on and on. Machines doing this. I mean, the finding of the data, right? not the sense making. <laughs> I'll talk more about that in a second. Right? This is a very interesting sector that's unfolding here, this automation of this thing, and then it could potentially lead to some sort of bubble that we're sitting inside of this huge amount of information but not looking outside, potential danger of that. So I think the bottom line with this is when we have so much intelligence, when we have at our fingertips more information than the President of the United States 15 years ago, what are you going to focus on? You're going to focus on getting more data, more research reports, more numbers, more stats? No, we're going to focus on making it human. You're going to focus on the human factor of that information. Our future is not to beat the machines, because we can't. We're not going to beat the machines because the machines are getting incrementally smarter every day and exponentially every 18 months. So we have to focus on our future work functionality as humans, and this is really where it gets interesting. I came up with this quote here from uh, Einstein who said, imagination is more important than knowledge. It's kind of interesting talking to learning people and knowledge is sort of the holy grail of things, right? Uh, and yeah, it's about knowledge, but knowledge on the first level, data, information, knowledge, and then what some people refer to as wisdom or realization or ideas or whatever you want to call the top level of the pyramid. So moving from the left to the right brain, that only humans can do. I would wager that eventually machines could do some of that. You know, Watson's, IBM's Watson has beat people in jeopardy, jeopardy which does take some of the right brain, you know, imagination. But that's safely away for a little while. So the question here is, is life becoming stranger than fiction? I think in many ways already is, but what do we do about this? Here's a short video. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Scanadu. We are a health electronics company that make the medical tricorder, which is a comprehensive medical device that takes over the diagnostic experience of a major clinic in a very small um, uh, device which connects via Bluetooth to your smartphone and gives you all the readings in 10 seconds. So you have to uh, take it in your left hand okay. and put uh, your index over this slide and your thumb on the electrode here. Okay. Yeah. And, and then, yeah. 
and then you have to create an electrical circle by a circuit by indeed. Now but we're, we're truly talking Star Trek here, right? I've ordered one, I haven't gotten it yet. But but people are saying that if this device works, the tricorder, you know, from, from Star Trek, actually that term is from Star Trek, right? Then for doctors, a lot of the work of a doctor of diagnosis, this machine can do better than a team of doctors diagnosing allegedly. You know, what comes afterwards, I don't know. I hope there's some doctors in the audience who can clarify this. But just like the journalists aren't replaced by bloggers, which we're seeing, it's, that's not the case, the doctors will not be replaced by this machine. But what does it mean for knowledge, information? I mean, what we're seeing here is a true sense of the Star Trek experience. Now, I would say that right next is going to be the tricorder for learning. Okay, the tricorder for learning is the same idea saying that all the stuff that's intelligence that's in the system channeled into one device. So you can tell the device what you need, what you need to learn, and it will instantly supply that information in some way that you can quickly learn it with audio, video, text, images. In a way, we already have this. So tricorder of learning may look like, like this. Can you fly that thing? Not yet. Operator. Tank, I need a pilot program for a B-212 helicopter. Hurry. Oh, well, you know, it's obviously a movie, but <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I was a guitar player, a musician for a long time. I certainly hope this won't happen in the near future so I can all of a sudden learn how to be a great musician. But anyway, I think what we have to face is that basically mobile devices are already our external brains. In many ways, like my kids, it's the only brain they have. It's, it's on, the internal, on the external device. Because what we're doing here is when we're sitting down at the bar having an argument about the capital of Kazakhstan or so, we can instantly look it up. You want to find out if you should buy or sell your stock? Just hit a button, you're gone. Right? So these devices are our brains. Whether we like it or not, in fact, without the device, you, you're, you're missing that part of it. And the question really is, like a cab driver who doesn't know the way around town without navigation, is that acceptable or not? I don't know. I mean, I certainly wish that they would, but many of them don't, not even with the navigation. <laughs> so the question is, what are we doing about this? And language, for example, is the next thing on this agenda. Automatic language translation is two years away. Already works fine now. It's a little bit complicated and geeky. It's sometimes expensive. In two years, you can call somebody in English and it will come out in Chinese, in real time. Check it out. Translates audio, uh, spoken word, in real time. So we can speak to it in English, it will translate to Japanese, uh, and you can, vice versa, you can translate Japanese into English. This works with up to 10 languages, so uh, we're going to give it a shot. All right. Where are you from? <laughs> Well, it's a little bit noisy there, but scary thought. Will our, will our children still learn languages? This would be like saying, you know, going to play guitar here, or will you still learn guitar? You know? So lots of things will change in our world because of this, and I think we're moving pretty much into a world where we can safely say technology has on, been on the outside, and then we've moved inside with the iPad and with Google Glass, and very soon technology is inside of us. I'll leave you with thinking about what that means for learning. But basically what it means is that data and information, the raw stuff, is going to be completely just there. A commodity to some degree, but the sense making is the next level that we have to focus on. Just like, you know, the CNN can show me 100,000 uh, tweets about Turkey, but to make sense out of it, I do need the opinion of a professional analyst or somebody who looks at all the details and tells a story. So the storytelling, that's the important part, I think, that we're going to see in the future. Again, a quote by Ray Kurzweil, who says that basically search engines won't wait, wait for us to ask for information. They will know you like a friend. Machines will know you like a friend. My friends don't know that about what I'm searching, but I guess they'll be better than my friends, I suppose. But this is an interesting scenario that's basically leading towards this realization. You're finding relevant stuff. It's probably becoming a, a software job. So if you're in the business of information advantage, finding relevant stuff is not a lasting advantage because it has to do with data and data mining and orchestrating and filtering and most of these things will move over to smart devices. 
So, however, finding is only the bottom line of the pyramid. Because you can find lots of stuff, but what do you do about it? How do you make sense out of it? I think this is where visuality comes in, you know, creating visual representation, storytelling, cross-media, intuition, imagination. So we're shifting our work towards a world to where we are doing all the stuff that used to be uncalled for. In fact, I would say that most companies, if you say to your boss that it's all about imagination and you want to reimagine how the company works, he would tell you to get lost. He doesn't want you to imagine anything, he wants you to produce results. That is not our future. Producing results can be done in many different ways, but imagination is the soft skill. And we're moving over to a world, I think, to where we're clearly going to see this becoming center stage. Oops, sorry. So the question is, if our work and our output is robotic, mechanistical, we will be beat by the machines. And that is the process that we're in right now. So if learning is about robotic stuff, you know, hard facts and nothing else, return on investment in the original sense of the world, will be surpassed by intelligent software agents. So we must actually set free what makes us human. Because the future can't be to compete in this place to where we don't have IBM Watson's memory. We just don't. And we don't, we can't beef it up as much as Ray Kurzweil says we should take vitamin pills to make that work and, and get artificial implants and so on and so on. We won't. So we have to think about what sets us apart from this in the future and we have to figure out how we can live in a world where we have a complete human machine interface. And with machine, I don't mean robots. I mean intelligent software agents that, that go out and fetch information. In a way, Google is already is doing that for us. Google pretty much knows what you think. Facebook knows what you, what you say, because you're saying, I'm having a coffee with X, Y, Z. But Google knows what you think, because you know, you're Googling for you know, cure for fungus nail or something, then Google can pretty much know what the problem is. And Google, in fact, can predict an outbreak of the flu epidemic. Because the day before, 20 million people look for information on, because they have already nose. So it's quite interesting what's happening here now on this interface. We're moving to a world, towards a world where we have this rapid overlap of those two things. Massive evolution. And the jobs that are going away because of this. So There's the stats actually from McKinsey again showing all the jobs that already went that were automated away, as they call it. That's a reality that we have to look at for our companies, for ourselves. How do we actually do this? And here's a scary curve I cooked up myself to give you some, you know, wake up effect. Not that you need it, but the green curve is traditional human work. Production work, assembly work, data mining work, declining from now to 2040 to almost zero. Checkout clerks, garbage disposal, financial analysts, all that stuff can be done sooner or later by machines. And then we have the work that is essentially software and machines going up on this curve. And an interesting other curve here, the blue one, is the only human work that can only be done by humans, which currently hardly exists. A little bit of that. I'll, show, I'll talk more about that, what that means. But basically, our entire learning and the preparing for the future is moving into this direction. And that's something that we should consider when, when it's about taking the next step. You know, really we have this handshake between human and machines. We're looking at human-only work, data, and artificial intelligence and software. So as an example, human-only work could be things like design, creation, negotiation, realization, foresights. Uh, facilitation, advising, therapy, you know, what, whatever, you know, soft skills. And these are the previously looked down upon jobs, you know, somebody who is imagining something wouldn't necessarily, would be more like an artist than, the, than a businessman. But now it's all about this, it's all moving into this direction because a computer can't imagine, reimagine a scenario, not yet. You know, in some ways they can do a little bit of this, but it's very static. This job here is about engineering, interfaces, design also, technology, maintenance, and science. Also, you know, great future for a lot of people to work in because, you know, to run the intelligence that will exist there. And finally, regulation, innovation, policies, ethics, guidelines that we also have requires human input. But 
in this shift from 80% up to 80% of our work shifting to this in the next 10, 20 years. It means a lot for learning. It's a whole transformation of what it means for learning. So as uh, Henry Poincaré says, logic proves, intuition discovers. You want to beat machines on logic, don't try. And that has been what we've done actually in business. In many cases, we want to be more logical and quicker and you know, more efficient. And that, that's great, but the future is going to be about intuition. It is going to be to use that logic of something else supplying us with the possibilities. I call this humor rhythms instead of algorithms. I don't want to live in a world of algorithms that tells me I have to change because I don't fit the algorithm or that classifies me of what's called the quantified self or the quantified worker and assigns a value to my social conversation in the company. That's interesting, you know, from an exhibitionist point of view. But is that the future of what I want to do? Do I want to be subject to an algorithm that's run by a machine? I, I don't think that's our future. So we have to think about humor rhythms. You know, what makes it possible for us to use that information and to use that technology without becoming enslaved in it? And, you know, you heard about this word many times in the past. This is the next social media in a way. <laughs> so big data, all the information that we're supplying and that's being used as the last couple of weeks of debate have shown, uh, you can truly say that data is the new oil. It's had for years. In fact, we're now in the replacement process. The oil companies are out and the data companies are in. Many people call Google the next Exxon, you know, not to be bad about Google is one of my clients, so don't want to suggest that, but there are people saying this basically becoming the shift towards the data economy. And this is very good for all of you, because guess what? This data is the, the raw resource of our intelligence. So we have to get familiar with this, and we have to stop barking up this tree of saying, all we need to know is get more data and more information and be more logical. That's good, you know, that's not a bad thing. You know, we need this. But we're barking up the tree, and really the action is over here, right? The action is in the transformation. And this is going to be our daily job in the future. <laughs> yeah, to become a robot, not just kidding. No, but to change. Right? To change on the fly into something else. And I think this is also, of course, for our companies, this is really, really important. We're going from transformation like, like this caterpillar here, uh, it's a critical thing to be able to do this, but what's more critical even is this, is to adapt on the fly. Not everybody can do this, clearly. I mean, it's not everybody is a chameleon. So how do we deal with this? I mean, how do we deal with uh, transformation as needed? You know, we have changed on an unprecedented scale. The industrial mindset of producing things and then reproducing this, that's moving away and we're moving into a world of, of this, right? a global village of information, of exchange, of peer-to-peer -peer economies, of the user-to-user -user interaction. So this is not gonna go away, this is still gonna be there, of course, but, but, but this is where it goes. And then the next level, of course, is the, the brain on steroids. I'll leave that topic for another time. Right now, I think this is really what we should be talking about when we talk about the future of work. So the end of those spaces is near, and I think this is clearly driven, you know, in your daily life when we have absolute consumer empowerment by using technology. We can go to TripAdvisor and just, you know, talk about this restaurant like they were uh, the worst thing in my life. You know, I should actually do that from last night from where I went. But we have information, we have empowerment. We can go to Facebook and start an action against the bank and force them to change their policy. It happened last year 67 times. 24 laws overturned using Facebook action. More efficient than the government of Switzerland using direct petition, which I, where I live, you know, we have lots of that stuff happening every day. So this idea of living in this, you know, in this dome of protection, publishing, media, banking, Switzerland, living in a protected environment, clearly we're going away. Now, it's basically happening here, media, money, banks, telecom, education, learning, and work outside of the dome, no more protection. 
So this is actually very good news, because what happens here is all of a sudden this is set free. And using the consumerization and the user control, it becomes more of an ecosystem. It really has always been an ecosystem. But there's companies, of course, who would like to own training or technology platforms like, you know, Microsoft used to own pretty much computing. And now we're moving into a world from ego to eco. And this is the title of my next book, in fact. But it's an ecosystem that we're building in learning and training education, a connected inter interdependent system. A little bit like this. This is the Osani tribe. They play a game to where this game only works if you all sit around in circles and put the feet in the middle. There is no game if, if it's not connected. So a lot of the things that we're going to be doing in the future will depend on creating ecosystems that are closed, that are actually working. Is this already happening if you're looking at examples like these? Patients like me who get together, Medify, Udacity, Coursera, Asthma Police, the, the asthma thing I talked about earlier. There's thousands of companies who use this operating paradigm. And I think, yes, you can be just one guy with, a, with your feet. That still works, but it's harder. It's all, all about ecosystems. So we're moving into a direction that's really quite clear, and I'll wrap up very soon so we can get to our talk. The direction is clear. In this old network paradigm from 1964, Paul Baran, moving from centralized to decentralized to distributed, and I adapted this to locked, loose, and liquid. Can you work and be successful in a locked entity? You can, but it's very difficult, and it's going to be very likely near impossible in the future. Because everything is interconnected. Can you work at Apple and they are, you know, they're firmly on this side? You can, but it's timing out. So the thing is, of course, this is not an either-or conversation, it's actually all interconnected. So sometimes when you work for a company, they want to keep something locked because it's the holy grail. They don't want to share that or, or even talk about it. Uh, it's a combination of things. But clearly the trend is clear. It's moving towards a liquid economy, not in the other direction. That's really true, I think, for pretty much any business. Global shifts in what we do. Look at this slide from LinkedIn, talking about how industries are shrinking. I mean, newspapers, not a surprise. Restaurants, warehousing, capital markets, supermarkets, shrink, shrink, shrink. That's what they're saying. But the good news is all the green dots that are growing as a consequence of the data economy. If I zoom a little bit in here, internet, online publishing, renewable energies, e-learning, you guys are right on the top of that scale. The global shift here is that e-learning becomes a substitute for strategy. Basically saying what we do here is run the whole company a different way because it's a different paradigm of how you do your business. So what it requires our companies and ourselves to do is we have to be part of the global brain. The conversation that goes on around the world about these issues, the learnings and all these things, that's already going on and we have to become part and contribute to that global brain. We have to get out of our silos, as Don was saying earlier. You're stuck in a silo where you guys are the learning guys, or those guys are the marketing guys, and over here are the engineers. That's a death wish, because there's no such thing. The reality is that these silos were useful in the past before we had technology to merge them. We have to get out of them. We have to empower each other to get out of this side. So let me wrap up. We're drowning in information but start for knowledge. Our job is not to supply more information and more noise. That's not a bad thing. It can be useful, but it results usually just in overload, not in learning. Learning is an experience. So we're moving over here to this, you know, from data to information to knowledge to wisdom. Wisdom is learning, realization, some sort of thing that you believe in, because that's really what you're talking about when you're talking about learning, right? That's some belief that happens there. So how do you get to be indispensable? This is the question, as I said last time I was here. If you can be dispensed off, you will be. That's an assumption you have to make. That's what I call digital Darwinism. If your organization can be dispensed off because it's no longer providing real value, like the record labels, for example, you will be dispensed with. And there's still value in record labels, for example. 
but the value is moving into a different direction. So unless you're indispensable, you can assume that somebody will cut you out. And I'm sure you experience this every day when you're talking to your clients, right? They're saying, okay, show me why I should do this. And why am I indispensable? Right? Being or becoming or remaining indispensable. Going back to what I said earlier, I think the digital default is mostly, not entirely, but mostly a huge opportunity. As you know, there's many issues about privacy and addiction, and won't get into that, clearly. But this is a great opportunity for innovation, for transformation, for thinking how we can do this on the fly and going forward into this new world. So, now, let's talk and take some questions. Okay. Uh, I'm never sure on the opening keynotes of these events whether it's the coffee in the morning, the wine from last night, or the speaker that I've just listened to that makes my head think like it's about to explode. But I think in this case, I'm pretty sure which one it was. I was jotting down stuff from the Twitter stream, Gerd. Sarah Burke, Sandra Burke shared my thoughts. My head is about to explode. Other words that came out, Alex Watson, discomfort, Kate, terrifying, James, what makes you human? Ben Bett said exciting. Not scary. Laura said terrifying but inspiring. Somebody else said you're pulling out a sound bite per second. It's difficult to keep up. <laughs> so much to think about. Now listen, every time I've ever spoken in my life, I've always had, to, always had to shift some furniture. I'm going to do that in a second. I would just like to ask you very quickly to discuss with your newfound friend, are you anxious, excited, or a bit of both? And then we're going to do a quick poll once we've got these comfy chairs up to the front. So go ahead and release those feelings you've been bottling up for the last 30 minutes. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Twitter was going completely bonkers, uh, <laughs> completely bad. Okay, yeah, I saw saying. that, yes. That's good, that's good. Right, let's pull them up. And uh, the first, I've got I've got loads of stuff I've been reflecting on. What you've described completely matches my vision of where we're going in the future. My concern is for my family and for my industry is how do we make sure they're ready for it. So that's that's okay. what we're here for. Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm going to pull that down. There's no point. Thank you very much. I think that's the only time the glass and the pen just, just haven't worked because there was so much chat going on, which is great. So very quickly, show of hands, who thinks they're excited by the future? Hey, fantastic. Okay, hands down. Who's a little bit anxious? That's okay, right? And who's a bit of both? I think I am, yeah. And that's okay. I think that's, I think that's all right to be a bit of both. Um, Gerd, I'm going to ask people to throw their hands up in the audience. Anybody got a question right now for Gerd before I throw one up at him? Go ahead. <coughs> one of your slides showed the uh, human only work increasing. Uh, but I wonder what, what drives that? So I suppose the question is how much of that kind of work actually needs to be done? In yeah. Ways that makes jobs for small I'll repeat back so, so we've got <laughs> yeah. that. Okay, so. How much human work is there? Is it increasing at sufficient rate? Is there enough to go around for everybody? Yes, well, <clears throat> that's a difficult question. I think that we're already seeing this emerge now. For example, uh, as social media has forced us to become more transparent and open, you have social media managers which are on this curve that didn't previously exist, right? So they're using the social data to analyze the sentiment. And yes, you can use a computer for that, but it's, it's not enough. It's just a data point. My view is that the more data we have and the more information, the more intelligence we have in those machines, the more we need us to make sense of it. Uh, it's like saying we have, you know, we have what, uh, 64 million songs 
that have been published in music. I, I don't want to listen to 64 million songs. I want to listen to one good song. So, you know, how do I find out? I need somebody to make a playlist. So, just the fact that we have more stuff doesn't mean that we're being made, made superfluous, but because we're not generating more stuff. But being a filter, being a curator, imagining solutions, you know, recognizing patterns. You should read uh, William Gibson's novel, Pattern Recognition. That's kind of what we have now. And uh, so I think that I'm, I wouldn't be necessarily worried about this uh, being an environment where we get squashed. Uh, but clearly, we will need some regulation and ethics about what's okay and what's not okay, as we've seen in the last few weeks. Uh, and so, uh, quite a bit of wisdom required by governments. Just, if I can jump in very quickly on that, we've seen a, a you were going to go to Istanbul last week. You, you found it difficult to do so because of what was going on there. Um, the government there has just brought in a, or is about to bring in a law, apparently, where it's going to be checking out what people are saying on social media. Uh, to see if people are distributing falsehoods on social media, uh, inciting people to riot. They should just look to television, then they would have all the falsehoods you can find. Well, it, it, is there an issue in the future, I'm not talking about any particular geography, where uh, we could see social media being used not as a liberating tool, but as a tool of repression? Absolutely. It's like nuclear energy. It's, I mean, yeah, you can kill people with it. Yeah. it. I mean, basically, if you're looking towards all of the electronic media that we have and the internet and social media, in terms of lying and, and the wrong things, you know, all of that was already plenty of that in television. And looking at weapons of mass destruction, didn't exist. Every single television station, the network in the world said, oh yes, we have clear evidence. And, you know. okay. So, I mean, this is not a basic question of social media or of electronic yeah. media. This is a question of, of general media. But per uh, perhaps there are lots of jobs there on, on both sides of the fence. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Do you want to repeat that? You repeat back, yeah. Yeah, okay. So the, que the question was about the, the relevance of emotion as a future learning tool. Uh, to me, I think basically what's happening now, we're in the role reversal of, you know, before we had organized education and sort of the industrial society, we were all about these things, right? Storytelling, emotions, and, you know, ephemeral things, and even religion and those kind of things. And now then we went to this place to where it was better to be a machine, you know, to be fast and have information and pull up stuff and crack numbers and run spreadsheets and, you know, now we're going back to that. All that stuff is going to be taken by machines. So then the other stuff that we need to do is to, to create emotional context and relevance uh, and what I call sense making. That is a skill that will remain the foreseeable future with us. Uh, I don't know for how long, but at least for quite some time. <laughs> yeah, but I think that in general, I think the uh, learning is going to be about making that difference on the emotional mm. and on the, on the level that can't be computed. Yeah. Yeah. I, not, not to say that computing is a bad thing, it's not. You know? There's lots of great business models that have to do with these things. Yeah. But it only gets you to one point of a, 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 a machine realization isn't the same than a philosopher. Yeah. Yeah. There's a difference. Got a, we've got a hand right at the back there. Go, go ahead and shout it out. I don't know where the microphones are, but yeah, give us. Great question. <laughs> I don't force them into a machine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think we're on a very good way with this already, in general. The, the priorities need to shift to produce people who are capable of, of rocking the boat and disrupting things. Because, you know, the, the driving force beco be, uh, behind the economy today is, is not uh, uh, marginal improvements. It's disruption. It's all about disruption. And how can you disrupt something if you can't imagine what the alternative is? You know, ask Richard Branson. You know? I mean, he imagines something completely different, and he just, he just goes for it, and then it blows up or not. But, you know, this is about disruption. And as I was saying, transformation is something that you would never do if you didn't have pain. You know, if, if there's no reason to change and if you're comfortable, why would you do anything? And this is why I'm inflicting some pain on you on this, on the, because basically, the, you know, why would you transform if you don't have a reason to move? Why would you yeah. change your organization if you're not facing death right? or, or, or facing some sort of problem? Right? You yeah. would never do anything about it. So the driving factor behind learning has to be to disrupt something that isn't working, to invent something, and 
you know, this is not a coincidence that American mentality, you know, the, what I call a basic cowboy mentality in a way, uh, is to just go for it no matter what, you know, this is a driver behind innovation. Yeah. Because it's, it's, you know, it has the spirit of, of uh, allowing that to happen, taking a leap and maybe falling into the ocean. I, I would say as one answer, I have two children, I encourage my daughter to daydream. A lot, of, a lot of time at school they're told it's a bad thing. I say, no, go ahead. You know, just spend an hour on your bed thinking about nothing. Um, because that's something which is natural as children. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, the, the, older, the brain is a plastic environment, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and it's clearly proven that if you do certain things, you can shape it to be different in the plasticity. Mm. So that's what we have to use to change what we do, yeah. rather than saying we should always be the same because it's the safest place to be. Yeah. And this is what, what's happened to our companies. The ones that you think are safe, they're the first ones to go off the cliff. Yeah. So if you don't think you're safe, I mean, look at all the in really innovative companies like Google and, 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 uh, and Renren and China and, and, and Twitter and so on. I mean, they're basically reinventing themselves every three months. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Come to Okay, so, so you're asking about uh, the social consequences and the, the, of the systematic consequences, really, of, of these trends. I think eventually it leads to a simple conclusion, you know, we'll get paid without working. And this is, I mean, conclusion is quite obvious, you know, when you think about what this means, you know, this is, it sounds more like artists than it sounds like business people, but, but in the end, basically what it means, that there, is a, there is a trend towards creating value without immediately uh, translating into productivity. Uh, and when you have that, it basically means you get paid to do something that's not ne narrowly defined. Uh, and, and as that expands, then basically means you get paid doing that anyway. Uh, so I think, for example, the, uh, the global conflicts that we have about you know, food and uh, uh, poverty and terrorism, they can only be solved on this level of saying redistribution of these assets to those that don't have it. Uh, and the same is going to be about work. Um, so, I mean, this is a, uh, what is sometimes referred to as sustainable capitalism. Um, I don't want to stress you out with further brain food for this, but, but, but this is basically where we're going, is that we cannot sustain a growth that means yeah. we're always going to do more stuff and buy more stuff and, 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 and create the spiral until it blows up, and that's, we already have that. There was, was there a hand up down here? No? Sorry, okay, clap. Go ahead. Yeah, so future job roles. I mean, clearly, uh, you're going to see uh, a lot of interface designers, people who are, who are taking technology data and creating human interfaces to it. In, in a primitive way, this is what Flipboard is doing with Twitter feeds and you know, creating an interface so we can read it. Uh, also, visuality, which is uh, creating data and, infinite, and, and creating something that is an image of that data mm -hmm. so that we can immediately understand what it is. Uh, in a simple terms, for example, it means that everything is moving to video and images, so a lot more video making, video production uh, for companies that has to do with social media and so on. But uh, software designers uh, and, of course, machines, people that take care of the machines <laughs> and write those programs. Uh, but also things that are basically um, foresighting and forecasting, so helping companies create the new reality. Uh, in a way, we're already seeing this trend, so, you know, not necessarily futurists, but people who are looking at foresights. Um, so I think, as I was saying, it's shifting more towards the right side, even though that distinction is really old-fashioned. But, okay, let's say, in general, that's kind of where it's going. So shifting to this idea of, of uh, creating more uh, ephemeral value that's not necessarily attached to a precise output. There's job definitions that we're already seeing. For example, the chief data scientist. I mean, every company in the world, top 1,000 companies, are looking for chief data scientists. Every company. I mean, if you, if you know something about data, you can get a million-dollar job right now. Uh, because basically, every company wants to figure out how to use publicly available data 
through public APIs and information from social network to generate some sort of sense-making product with marketing or advertising related things or product development and so on and so on while not infringing on privacy. Mm. I mean, there's at least a thousand startups in the privacy sector. Mm. So that's a huge business, for example, a future business is a privacy warden. Right? Privacy warden. A privacy bank. Swiss companies want to be that, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. But um, I think there's, there's jobs that we haven't heard of so far. Yes. That, that yeah. I mean, if you're looking at the jobs now, your community managers, what was that 10 years ago? Nobody knew what that Two years ago. Yeah, it sounded like a communist yeah. uh, setup <laughs> or something, community manager. So, I mean, so we have to reimagine job definitions. Yes. I'm hoping you solve the problem of worry for two years. <laughs> That's interesting. Does, does technology level the field? Is it the great leveler? It does. You know, the, I think we have both effects. We have mm -hmm. the level of the playing field and we have the Darwinism factor. Yeah. But basically what that means is I think that um, not everybody can be a programmer or interface designer. You know, it's clearly, I mean, somebody at the checkout clerk is not going to be a programmer tomorrow. But in terms of what we teach our kids and what they should be learning is that they should learn how to relearn and unlearn and transform like the transformer into the next thing. That is the skill that they should learn in the first place. Because, you know, if you look, for example, the production of iPads, you know, it takes 323 people touching the iPad to make it. And therefore, it has moved from Japan to Korea to China and now to Vietnam and next week to Greenland, maybe. But wherever the cheapest people are that can touch the iPad. Right? Uh, there's no sense in that at all. Because it basically creates an artificial little bubble and it goes away to the next thing. Right? So that using Baxter, the robot, to do that would make more sense. But then those people that did this don't have to work. Right? So what do we do with them? And how do we bring them into a new workforce? Result is, in the end, we have to train them to go back to what they really can do with human skills. Not everybody can be a therapist or, or, you know, or a cook, which can't be replaced with a machine except for certain restaurants, but uh, <laughs> so, you know, like, so those, are, those are big societal issues which I don't really have an answer for in the, lo in the long run, but probably means redistribution of resources. Good, I'm going to take this back now with, with, with a final question, I'm just looking at my clock here, with a, with a final question to bring us back to the training stroke learning industry. I always say that a big part of our job is to find, filter, interpret and share information because there's, there's an awful lot of it out there or to make it possible for other people to do that there's an awful lot out there and rather than just trying to pump people full of knowledge our job is to try to uh, help people get what they need either in the short term or the long term to develop themselves now we talk an awful lot about the find the filter and the share side of that on the technology side because there's lots of great tools for it but that bit in the middle the interpret piece is really where we can and should be adding value how do we do that and how do we do it so we're not in a silo, but as you were saying, distributed, or as I was saying, outside the training ghetto, being part of the business? Yeah, I think most of these changes happen in a way like a virus. You know, if, 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 you, if what you're doing becomes a virus, and people are excited about this and telling it to others, then it takes off very quickly and the company has changed. And then if you can get the CEO to be infected with the virus or the board, then even better. But sometimes I don't have a choice. Yeah. You know, I, we do a lot of training with companies, and usually if one virus gets out, that is just the perfect fit there. You know, then you can see it go very quickly and boom, it happens. Right? And otherwise, it takes years. But basically, you have to try to infect others with this kind of idea right. of what is actually happening. And it's, it's, it can't be theoretical. 
Mm. You know, running spreadsheets and showing PowerPoints is, is like, everybody's going to say, yeah, that's cool. You know, we could do it, but I don't really want to. <laughs> that, that doesn't work. You have to have an other impact on some level. So as, as I was saying, I think we're moving into a data economy and after, with that, the experience economy. You know, what do you actually experience when you go to a place? Uh, and, and, and when you, if you're looking to change your company, you have to sort of get a taste for it. You know, otherwise, you won't make that leap because it's not secure enough. And um, so, our job is to give this mixture of love and pain, basically. Say, okay, here you could really do this. It would be so great if we could do this, and everybody gets excited. And then you also have a reason to move because otherwise, you're a lame duck. Yeah. I mean, I, if you look, for example, at the car companies, Audi, BMW, and, and Volkswagen. And, some of those are my clients, you know, it's quite clear the car, the car economy as we know it is ending. Mm. Kids are not getting driver's licenses anymore on a global scale. I mean, it's, it's declining. The car is a status symbol, declining. So what are they going to do? They're going to become a mobility mm -hmm. enterprise. That right? requires a serious transformation like the robot. You know, it's, uh, and so the reason you, the way you push this forward is by planting the seeds in different places so that they connect. And then, and then you have sort of a momentum that comes out of that. As I said when I stood up, there's an awful lot going on in my head at the moment. <laughs> and I'm sure there's an awful lot going on in yours. I've got this combined image of planting seeds, pain, love, and viruses. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me give one short uh, advice for the, for the, I think, for the future of work. Huh? Becoming indispensable. That's the key. That is the key. Yeah. Your company, you yourself, and you don't do that by just being smarter and quicker, better. Yeah, it, it won't work. There is, a, there is a benefit in that, being better, smarter, quicker, but it's about being more human that makes it indispensable. There's so much to take away from this. And I do feel we could sit here and carry on this conversation all morning and continue to learn a lot from it. Sadly, I have to get us to the next point in the agenda. That's my job. I have to say thank you for your contribution, um, putting in your... Thank you. Thoughts by Twitter. And thanks also to Gert Leonard. Thank you very much. I think a lot, of us, a lot of us had both hands up, anxious and excited. I'm hoping now we're a little bit more excited than we were anxious. I feel we do have some way forward here. Okay, we have a half-hour break. We'll come together again at half-past for the next sessions. I look forward to spending the rest of the day with you. <laughs>